Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly Q&A show. You got any tech related mountain bike questions? Let us know in those comments underneath this video. Uh, please use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. This week we're in my workshop. We're actually uh, self-isolated at the moment, so I thought I'd self-film one. It turns out to be mostly retro questions, so a bit of a retro special. First one is from Zach Pilot. My 1998 Cannondale Super V 700's fork is leaking oil and I need to fix it, but I don't know what to do. Most of the bike shops have just told me to replace it due to its age. What should I do? Okay, so this is a similar bike. I don't know if it's the same model as yours on the screen right now. Uh, and the fork on it is a Cannondale Headshock. So this was a predecessor to the lefty. It used a four-sided steerer tube that had needle bearings on each side. And accordingly, it needed a very specific service routine. Now, Cannondale used to do this exclusively through their dealers and had specifically trained people that actually take this out uh, and would do this process. It's quite complicated, there's a lot of small parts and also there's some very specialist tools. So I asked my friend Finn over at Full Factory Suspension because he used to do this for Cannondale back in the day. Uh, here's a little video clip just to show you the sort of stuff you would need. So for Cannondale you're going to need a couple of tools. You are going to need a top cap tool my one from uh, the 90s okay you're gonna need castle tool tip cartridge out. pretty specific piece of kit you're gonna need uh, this tool which holds the sliders in the hedgehog if you go that deep down the rabbit hole uh, what else is there I think that's about it you also need some inner tube uh, you might need to modify and make a tool kind of like this, which I made out of an old slider. So yeah, they're pretty specific bits of kit that are uh, kind of difficult to get hold of sometimes. Well, there you go. Like I say, it's quite specialist. I'm going to throw a link to full factory suspension in the comments underneath this video. Uh, if you click through to there, you can ask any inquiries. Um, if anyone's going to be able to help you out, it will be Finn. Because uh, if you ask Cannondale in the UK or Europe, they'll probably refer to refer you through to him anyway, because he used to do most of this stuff back at Muddock. And in fact, uh, going off topic here, slightly amusing story. He was really close friends and still is with Clive Gosling, who's one of the guys from Cannondale and the Cycling Sports Group. A particular hot summer's day, Clive brought a bike into Seafin and needed a shock doing on it. Unfortunately, he seemed to have gone through some uh, some dog eggs on the bike and not paid any attention to it, just gave it straight to the workshop. Number one mistake, never take a bike into a, a workshop that you wouldn't take into your own home. Um, kind of disrespectful really, but those guys being friends, Finn thought he'd have a practical joke with them because he knew Clive was going to be taking that bike around the country, uh, showing it off to different bike dealers and stuff, and he'd be doing it in a van, and it was a heat wave at the time, so Finn popped upstairs to the, uh, the kitchen, got a fish, popped it in that seat tube there, put the seat post back in the bike, and uh, hey Clive, here's your bike, nice and shiny. Uh, I imagine the uh, road trip was pretty amusing after that, so uh, moral of the story, never annoy a bike mechanic. Uh, but good luck with that one, he should help you out or at least give you some advice on what you need. Next up's from Rocky Trails. Dolly, how, does, uh, how old does something need to be to be considered retro and what type of mountain biking stuff is of interest for your show segment? Um, well honestly we're pretty interested in most stuff that's mountain biking tech uh, but when it comes to retro I'd say probably 90s really counts as retro but you could say early early 2000s, uh, noughties is that? Um, yeah early 2000s. I'm talking things like uh, MRP chain devices, these were quite early. I'm talking like Azonic hammer stems, we're talking original DCDs, complete bikes, kit, it doesn't matter. As long as there's a story to it, like for example, this is the, the first DMR flat pedal, this was the first V12, and that really is the product that started that company. Um, there's loads of cool history out there, literally anything you can drag up, I would love to see it. Um, Henry maybe less so, because I think he uh, probably thinks I ramble on about this stuff, but um, hey, he loves more techie stuff than I do, I love the retro stuff, so we kind of work quite well together. Um, anything retro literally counts, so get it in, and if there's anything you want to know from me retro-wise, uh, please do ask away in those comments. Next up is from a Rico. Ask GMBO Tech, I've got a retro bike that I need to take a few pictures of for the Dirt Shed Show. It's got a great Marzocchi XC100 fork that still works flawlessly. Are these easy to service? 
Our parts even available um, is way beyond all those rubber shocks available back in the day. Can you tell us a bit of the history behind these and how they work? Um, wow, that's a very old fork. That's uh, 1992, I believe, the XC100. Uh, so it was an air and oil fork, as far as I remember, and I seem to remember it being an emulsion damper as well. So the air and oil was in the same compartment on the inside of the fork. Uh, very spindly outside design, very similar looking to the later XC500s, and I think there was like two, three, four, and 500s. Uh, they had separate air and oil in them. To be honest, I've not even ridden these forks. I've not seen them in the flesh other than on show bikes, uh, so I couldn't comment on how you would go about taking them apart. But Marzocchi in that era were extremely well made, so you probably can service them enough to make them work, but uh, other than that, I'm not too sure. I mean, here's a few images on the screen. Um, just an interesting fact though, it wasn't the earliest Marzocchi fork. The earliest one I think was called the Star Fork, and that followed on from the RockShox RS1, which came out in 88, uh, it followed on about 89. Um, and here's a little shot of that fork. Um, kind of cool, even more spindly. Look at the brake arch on that, but that thing did nothing. But super cool that Marzocchi were messing around with air and oil and coil and oil um, right from the very beginning. All right, next up's from Philip Lay. I once saw a retro mountain bike on GMBM which had a single pivot near the head tube and only a straight diagonal as the rear end. Do you know what the bike is? Um, okay, so there's a few here, so I've just set the scene a bit, so don't to jump straight to it. Now, one of the earliest unified suspension designs by Ibis was called the Sasbo, so this is it on the screen. Um, kind of cool, kind of quirky bike, had that thing where the suspension only really worked when you sat down, when you stood up it pedalled like a hardtail. They later followed that with the bow tie, which was a completely titanium version. It had no pivot at all. And that pretty much flexed on the down tube near the head tube, kind of like your suggestion there. Had a shock later down on the bike. It's a suspension bike and it relied on flex. I mean, bonkers. I know someone who's got one, so I'm gonna do a video of that bike soon. And I'm gonna see if he'll let me ride it just to see what it's like. Um, it's somehow beautiful though, but it wasn't that bike you're talking about. What I think you're talking about is the Norco Viper uh, ZTS. Yeah, ZTS. This is it on the screen. Look at this thing, this thing is insane. So yeah, like you say, it's got a pivot up by the head tube there. Uh, shock is in front of the seat tube and just under the top tube. And also, interestingly and kind of worryingly, look at the sliders that are on the side of the seat tube. Um, this thing must have had some severe side-to-side -side flex, so they kept everything in track. So obviously would have pedaled, um, well, not pedaled that well with a high pivot like that, but would have pedaled better than the, the bag of, um, yeah, bag of stuff that it would have pedaled like without. Um, pretty crazy bike, that one never saw production. Uh, thankfully, a couple of years later, they introduced their VPS pivot system, so they used the horse link, and actually their bikes were excellent, even from the very beginning. Um, took them a while to get those first suspension bikes out, but Norco actually are one of the most underrated bike brands out there, I think. They've got an enormous range of bikes, ranging from city bikes and BMXs to road bikes, mountain bikes. And their modern bikes are something else. Even their latest Aurum high pivot downhill bike. I mean, look at this. What a bike. Man, that thing looks fast, even sat still. Um, if you want to see some more crazy bikes, I'm going to put a video in the link underneath this video um, to a freaky bike thing that I made for Halloween last year. Uh, there's loads of obscure bikes in there, including the white PRST1, aka the Preston, the Dave Smart Interreactive, the Muddy Fox Interreactive. Uh, what else is in there? There's loads. So, Klein Mantra, uh, and also the Checker Pig that just got a carbon fiber spring, nothing else on it. Bonkers stuff, but pretty cool video nonetheless. Okay, next up, this one's a great question. This is from Matthias Mayer. Kudos for the show, loving the rewind stuff. Cool, thank you very much for that. Um, can you tell us about the evolution of the dropper post? Yes, I can. It started right here with one of these fellas. This is called the Height Right. Essentially, it's just a spring, it would clamp that way around, clamp around your seat post, this part would go onto your seat clamp, and quite simply, you would undo the quick release, sit down, and basically clamp it up again. The spring mechanism would actually keep your saddle in line, and enable you to drop the post, probably about two inches, um, quite a lot really by, by all accounts from those days. Releasing it would pop it back up to the, so the height that you predetermined. A genius idea when it first came out, and here's one of the original adverts for them. As you can see, they're invented by Joe Breeze and Josh Angel. Um, and they were quite cheap when they came out. The unfortunate thing was, uh, you had to take your hand off the bike basically to, to lower them, but that was still better than stopping your bike. Um, and they also required you to have a very well-made frame that had a really well-reamed and straight seat tube, otherwise you're never gonna be able to get the seat post to slide down inside of it. Amazing idea, uh, but obviously that 
made way for the new form of dropper post, which used kind of like office chair technology. The first of which was the gravity dropper. Excuse me. The first of which was the gravity dropper. Uh, this is one on the screen. They use a telescopic design with a whacking great spring in there and pretty much a rod or a shaft that went through that, um, through the post into determined holes, basically to notch it into place. Uh, really simple system, but it worked quite well, a bit clunky, but it, it did work. And I remember all the mountain bike action testers using them back in the day on all their bikes. Uh, really cool to see that. And then following on from there came the Maverick Speedball. So this one on screen, this is Maverick Speedball. Uh, I've got one of these still laying around. I think it's in the GMBM tech set actually at the moment. Three inch travel. Uh, there's two versions. One where you squash the lever under the saddle itself and one with a thumb shifter remote. Really, it worked quite well, but it did need a lot of maintenance. Crank Brothers later bought the design, turned it into the Joplin seat post. Uh, this is the Joplin on the screen. That's uh, also my one there. Um, they increased the travel, they improved a few things like the ceiling and stuff on it, but ultimately that was the end of the line for that design. Following off an air came the KS dropper post. Uh, the KS ones were quite cool, actually very similar in design to the Crank Brothers, but um, essentially just made with more durable, more modern parts. Uh, worked exceptionally well, to be honest, they were just a bit bland. And then in 2010, everything changed when RockShox came out with a reverb. Um, really, that is where the dropper post started. Hydraulic dropper post, hydraulic actuation, instant up and down. It was flawless, really, uh, by all accounts when it first came out. Bearing in mind that we weren't moaning about the fact that it had service license and stuff like that because it was such a breakout product. Um, really, you got to say thank you to RockShox for uh, all the excellent seat posts that are on the market now because it's them that did it first. But um, don't forget the little nod back to the 80s with one of these bad boys. Next up's from Skyflyer. Uh, ask GMBN Tech, retro question. Hi guys, I've been thinking about servicing the forks on my retro hardtails. Both are RockShox Hydrocool forks from the late 90s, uh, 97, 98 Judy C and a 99, 2000 Judy Race. Is there much difference in the way that you service these compared to more modern forks? And are there any specific greases or lubes I should be using on these older forks? Uh, loving the channel, by the way. Uh, thank you, by the way, in reverse for that. Um, in honesty, they're pretty simple. Uh, the telescopic forks, so they use the same principle as all telescopic forks. They'll have foot nuts or bolts on the bottom that you need to undo. Um, you need to use them to actually shock the inner shafts a little bit loose so you can actually slide the lowers off because uh, they'll be pretty set in place. Haven't been on there since, uh, well, since the 90s or the early 2000s. Uh, you might find there's some oil on the inside. Some of the later ones, I don't think the Judy had any sort of oil bath on the inside. Uh, they had a cartridge system. The later one you mentioned, the Judy Race, I'm not sure to be honest on that particular fork. I don't think so, um, but still there might be some gunk basically to drain out. So make sure you've got an oil pan or something like a desktop like this so you can actually drain it on without it getting anywhere nasty. Um, and then obviously pull them apart, clean them completely. If the bushes are knackered, and the seals are knackered, then really your, your best bet is to speak to full factory suspension or TF tuned or even rock shocks. But um, to be honest, trying to find new old stock now, you're gonna be looking at the dedicated suspension manufacturers who've been doing it from the first time around. Uh, probably go to TF tuned to try and get bushes or something like that. But, um, but Finn knows those guys really well. They all work together. So uh, speak to someone like that. There's gonna be links to both those companies in the description underneath this video. Um, if you're unsure about doing it, to be honest, with the retro stuff, I'd consider speaking to full factory suspension. Um, he doesn't specialize in it, but he was doing all that stuff from back then and it'll definitely help you out. So uh, definitely worth a try. Uh, one thing to say, actually, I've got some here. I'm just gonna reach behind myself and grab it. The original grease that you used to use on the Judy's was called Judy Butter. Um, you can still get the stuff, only now it's called Shram Butter. Exactly the same stuff, but with a bit more of a boring name. Uh, excellent product, it's really good stuff, but um, I'd love them to keep the old Judy Butter name just because uh, nostalgic reasons. There's a good story to be told there, and I feel like just by having the SRAM branding on it, I kind of lose that a bit. Maybe I should change the label on the top, I don't know. Just something I'd like to see. Okay, now last up, um, well, pretty big question. This one's from uh, It's Toffee Dan. Uh, this is a familiar sounding name, I've seen this one before. Um, what happened to floating disc brake frame designs? Used to be seen on a lot of bikes in the late uh, late noughties, uh, Kona's, Brooklyn Machine Works, Transition, etc. Okay, well, in that era, everyone was coming out with a new suspension design every 20 minutes, uh, approximately, maybe every 17. Uh, it was a rush to get the best suspension design out there, and in that rush, one of the things I had to sacrifice in order to get great suspension was suffering on the braking. 
Now, depending on where you had your suspension pivot points and how many of those you had on the bike, braking would have different effects on that suspension. Uh, for example, you could get brake jack or you could get brake squat. So brake squat would compress that suspension, brake jack would extend it. So as you, as you brake, it wants to tip you forwards. In an ideal world, you want braking to be isolated from the suspension or have as little effect on it as possible. So whilst there were all these brands that had these things, I think Kona's one was called Dope, their brake arm system. Um, there was Morwood Bikes, they had one as well. Literally everyone had some sort of brake arm out there. They were really good, but you think how much weight they were. They're just kind of unnecessary once people refined their suspension designs. A uh, good example of that is the four bar suspension design still used by many brands, including Norco. In fact, including Specialized, they started the four bar design thing um, using the FSI link, which was designed by Horst Leitner, um, who actually made the AMP research frame that I've still yet to consider building up, that I really must do. But that is as close as you're gonna get to isolated braking without introducing other factors like split pivots and things like that. Um, so really, it's just kind of out of date. It's not needed as much. Although that said, Danny Hart was spotted and some of the Saracen team racers on their Mist Pros uh, were spotted having those sort of brake torsion arms on their bikes. I forget which round it was last year at the World Cup, uh, but obviously in search of extreme grip. Um, so it is, maybe it's not going away on the out and out race scene. Uh, so we could see a comeback, but I'm not too sure on that. Um, if you like the retro stuff, seriously, what would you like to see us do here at GMB and Tech? I could talk to the cows come over that sort of stuff. I honestly love, well, you probably gathered that, I love the retro stuff. Um, let us know. Let me know in the comments. Uh, hit us up on Instagram at GMB and Tech, or you can fire them directly to me, whatever you want. Uh, we love this stuff, and we love you hanging around. So, uh, well, thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. And if you love what we're wearing, I mean... I obviously love this top, I wear it all the time. Uh, don't forget to click through to our shop because we've got some really cool clothing there and there's always new stuff coming out. So don't forget to uh, check back, bookmark the page and you'll see some specials coming. Cheers.